What are the things in your life that have infinite complexity upon closer inspection? As always, I'm your host, Aaron Gary, and I'm betting you didn't expect that question on a podcast about ice climbing. But that's Jackson Yip for you. An atmospheric researcher by training who specializes in cloud microphysics, Jackson is also a deeply passionate climber and alpinist who has coupled his interests in a myriad of ways. Whether scrabbling through murky data sets or slogging to break trail, Jackson finds beauty in the mundane and the labyrinthine. In this wide-ranging conversation, we talk about cloud physics and the complexity of turbulence, the importance of first-hand experience, how to develop mental models, why we can and need to do better when evaluating ice conditions, the mechanics of pillar collapse, and much, much more. Hope you enjoyed this chat. I certainly did. Before we get to the interview, a message from the folks who helped make this podcast possible. Blue ice is the best kind of ice, and also my choice when it comes to fast and light ice climbing gear. The aero lights go in like hot knife through butter, and their climbing packs hit the sweet spot between function and lightweight. Designed to get to the point in the Alpine, their gear is tested by mountain professionals between the Alps and the Wasatch. If you're looking to get to the point too, and with a little less weight in your kit, check out Blue Ice's gear at blueice.com or your favorite local retailer. I really debated starting like leaving this one in, but you were so like, I don't know if you were in a mood or if that's just like how you were. It was a lot of discussion about heat death. And then I had to look it up. And um, if it's all going to end up in heat death, why are we even doing this interview? Like you're in a janitor's closet <laughs> sitting on the floor. Should we just wrap up now? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. It sounds good. Talk to you later. No, I mean, first it's important to like define what we're talking about. Basically, the universe is an engine composed of ever smaller engines that take gradients and energy and dissipate them. And that's what we call entropy. And there will be a certain point where the universe has no more gradients because they've all been dissipated. And at that point, nothing can move, nothing can change. All of the entropy has been generated. And what we call that is heat depth. We as the, the royal we of physics that I am tangential to as a meteorologist. It's sort of this theoretical what happens if you take our current situation and take it to its logical end. At the end of the day, like there have been studies that have come out that have shown that the main purpose for life is to generate entropy more efficiently than if there weren't life there. The studies are mostly concerned with what happens if you have phytoplankton on the surface of the ocean versus not and measuring the amount of entropy that's generated in the presence of life or not. So at the end of the day, like the main philosophy that you can take from that discussion is, well, the point to existing is existing. And the point to that is just that you help the universe march forward because you're a participant in it. So, I mean, if you want to relate that towards things in our day-to-day -day life, I think it's very easy to become concerned with these sorts of things that feel as though they're too monumental for us to overcome, but we just kind of do our best to do what we do. And participating in that, in that mindset, I feel like is more sustainable than allowing us to take on that thought that the universe is just gonna end anyway, so why should I even care? It's the two mentalities for the same practical existence. Do you adopt that mindset consciously on a day-to-day -day basis? I think it depends on the situation. I mean, like, I think that it's hard for us in the day-to-day -to, -day to like conceptualize our existence into the greater framework of the universe. It's why we hold up these brilliant like astrophysicists on, you know, pedestals like we do with like Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of these individuals who hold both research positions in academia, but also hold public figure sort of domains as well. We need these sorts of oases of perspective that allow us to reconceptualize how we fit into the grander scheme of things. Because I can tell you for absolute certain that when I'm scared shitless on a pitch or I'm like, you know, neck deep and trying to figure out some new like modeling script or something like that for representing some atmospheric process, I don't tend to just like think to myself, wow, how beautiful is the universe? I, tend to just be stuck in that mindset. And I don't think that there's a problem with either mindset, but I think that like, there is a very strong importance to climbing a pitch that has, say, both those experiences, as well as the experiences of being able to stand there, like 
30 feet above your last piece and just sort of look around because you're not scared, you're just present. I don't necessarily flip a coin, but I think life is full of moments of tension and moments of detension. Being able to find that balance between those things is really, really important, both philosophically as well as like literally in terms of climbing or in terms of work or those sorts of things. In a lot of your work, like you deal with large data sets and I imagine like you're sort of wrangling, cleaning and sort of making sense of entropy. Like there's a lot of this like variance and a lot of noise and you're sort of like trying to make sense of, of this. You're sort of playing with entropy from like a numbers perspective, but then you also enjoy getting out into the elements and sort of experiencing that entropy from like a qualitative, just being in the elements perspective. To sort of give my background, my field of study is called cloud microphysics. And the thing that's really fascinating about clouds and the atmosphere in general, but in, in my particular interest, clouds, is that they're these sort of paradoxical entities in the human existence of when we're young, we think that these are objects that we can go out and touch. And then we go through this phase of realizing that they don't actually really exist. And then we go through this phase as researchers where we try to fly aircraft through them to actually be able to touch them, and you know, have these tangible objects back in our existence. And then the closer we look again, we see that they're actually an emergent property of something even more minuscule than we can touch again. So it goes to these ebbs and flows based on the scale at which you can like consider things. I guess like the root of what you're talking about is sort of this idea of how do we parse existence either qualitatively or quantitatively. Quantitatively, there are operational motivations for the work that I do. You know, we wanna understand basically the fluxes of moisture and heat into and out of the polar regions, because these are the areas that are the most vulnerable to climate change. It's sort of a, well, oh yeah, of course, that makes sense, but I didn't think about it, sort of thing of like, carbon dioxide is not the largest greenhouse gas, it's, it's water vapor. And clouds make up the large amount of forcing that's present in the atmosphere. So it stands for us to wonder then, like, why it is that current climate models, current weather models, don't handle cloud processes accurately. It's literally the reason that meteorologists are considered hacks or that, you know, why is the meteorologist getting the forecast wrong? It's like, well, it's because we don't understand it. Well, we don't really even understand when water freezes. You know, you can have liquid water, yeah, at zero degrees Celsius at the freezing point, but you can have liquid water exist all the way to minus 40 C. What that basically tells you is that, well, if I look at a pond that's frozen versus not, they reflect light differently. And they don't only reflect visible light differently, but they also reflect heat differently if we look closely at multispectral camera. Therefore, if you have a cloud that's all ice versus a cloud that's all liquid, how much sunlight does it actually reflect? Or how much heat leaving the ground does it actually reflect or absorb? And we don't understand the answers to these questions in a widespread way. And that's, that's most of my research is trying to understand those physics which drive the radiation balance in the atmosphere. In talking about these sorts of things that are very present in front of us, say, whether it's a cloud, which is something we've all experienced throughout our entire lives and will experience until the day we die, to, say, like noticing that small flower on a pitch or something as you're climbing up and you wonder, how did this get here in this rugged environment? There's just this little sprig sticking out of a crack. I think it's important for us to consider these things that seem incredibly mundane in front of us, but then once you look slightly closer, they expand into these unfathomably large systems of complexity. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like, I'd say two main aspects of things that I am philosophically entrenched in, that being cloud physics and alpinism, to say that I find that people are very concerned with things that are external to our existence, say like what's happening on the other side of the universe, you know, in some star system or something. The physics that govern that place are also governing our existence here. If you look closely at things that are right in front of us, you get to see the beauty with your own two eyes and not have to rely on a telescope or some space probe you sent millions of miles away. And I think that there's something really 
present in our modern existence that has to do with the fact that we have basically transcended the idea that you need to walk somewhere, <laughs> you know, yet we have taken on these hobbies that require you to walk somewhere. <laughs> There's a lot to be gained still from the idea of walking somewhere, whether that's in the mountains or through an incredibly large complex data set that you need to clear a bunch of noise from. So I don't know if that answers any, anything, but that's my general sense. You seem to really enjoy being in it, like being in the data or being in the environment. Has that always been the case for you or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when I was, when I was young, I, we were raised in this generation of being environmentalists. Like you were much more often to be raised as an environmentalist than you were to not be. For me, one of the biggest things that I saw from a really young age, and I think I've probably carried through in my mindset in some way, but it's probably become slightly more sophisticated, is that you don't know what you're fighting for unless you're in the place you're fighting for or with the thing you're fighting for. Originally, I got into atmospheric science because I was interested in environmentalism because, you know, we care about solving climate change and doing these sorts of things. It strikes this balance of being able to easily justify to other people that you are this person who cares about the things that are important to our existence. But at the end of the day, climate research is this fascinating area that both is extremely difficult and highly scientific, as well as, for lack of better phrasing, frivolous in its many aspects. Because we understand many of the things that we're trying to do. Like, we don't need more climate simulations to know that we have to change our energy system to something that doesn't generate carbon emissions. We have to change our agriculture system that doesn't keep polluting the oceans with fertilizers. It doesn't take seven significant figures to, to know these sorts of things. And I'd say for that reason, we become sort of trapped in this mindset of wanting more data and more knowledge for the sake of knowledge and not necessarily for the sake of solving problems. You can take beautiful satellite imagery of Everest or whatever peak you'd like, but you won't actually know and what's there or what it takes to get there unless you go there on your own two feet. And I guess that's probably a good segue to talk about, like I've been working on researching cloud seeding because it's kind of having a resurgence slash heyday because of a number of papers that have come out showing both the incredibly negligible environmental impacts of doing it for the fact that you can actually appreciably change precipitation amounts if you're strategic with it. There's a certain point when putting boots on the ground is, you know, more important than continuing to look just at the knowledge. And so you're doing, would you call classify this as basic research or just information gathering at this point? Because the data set doesn't exist. Um, it does exist because there are a lot of public facing data sets to, to mine for information. So like there are satellite retrievals that are archived and there are, you know, all these sorts of model data sets and reanalysis data sets and all these sorts of things to, to use for informing our decisions about things. But I think this is one of the reasons why I've been really enjoying this position that I'm currently in, because it's fascinating because when we get into a meteorology program, like out of high school or whatever, to like start going down this path. There, there's usually like an intro class, like as with any major, the professor asks, well, why are you here? Like, why, why do you want to be here? And, you know, like about three quarters of the room raises their hand to say like, well, because I want to become a storm chaser. And then the other quarter says, well, I'm probably going to drop out in you know, two months yeah. or whatever. You're too young to have watched Twister. <laughs> no, but that's one of those things. So like, this is one of the funniest things um, present in being both a climber as well as a meteorologist is that the same way that everyone's asked, oh, have you seen the Dawn Wall? Have you seen Free Solo? Is the same thing as, have you seen the Perfect Storm? Have you seen Twister? And more recently, have you seen Sharknado? I don't know that many people I can actually like commiserate with of how fucking funny it is that <laughs> these exist in other places. But like, because we're climbers, we only hear the like fucking Alex Honnold thing all the time. What my mom thinks I do versus what I actually do kind of thing. It is fully Twister. That is my life. It's, it's seeing how far a cow flies. That's the entire existence I hold. I am curious, from what you've gathered, why is there such a, a lack of inclusion of uh, water vapor in, in climate models? It's not for lack of trying. It's extremely hard. When you think about like, you know, tell me 
the temperature feel in a cup of coffee? Like, how do you operationally measure that down to a scale that actually drives the flow? Turbulence is really fascinating. If anyone who listens to this hasn't looked up the essence of what turbulence is and how difficult of a problem it is for, for scientists, I implore you to look it up because it's, it's fascinating. If only for the fact that it's another one of these things that's immediately in front of us when you wave your hand in front of your face, yet we don't have good physical models to actually describe it. That analogy, it's not even really an analogy, it's just literal, is that, you know, in a turbulent flow, you essentially have fractal behavior for spinning vortices of fluid. So if I want to understand both the hurricane scale flows, as well as the flows of the scale of when I'm moving my hand in front of my face, those are both atmospheric flows technically. So how do I actually measure all of that? And then if you introduce phase change as well, when ice is being created, when it's melting, when water is evaporating, when it's sublimating, all of these sorts of things, it sort of elucidates how incredibly difficult it is to collect these data. And it's one of the reasons that I've moved more towards modeling, if only for the fact that it keeps my anxiety under like 150% to know that I don't have to deal with knowing. <laughs> but it, it's one of these like, engineering constraints and not a scientific constraint, really. Like, it's an engineering constraint that is keeping us from understanding the underlying physics. If we had infinite microscopic UFOs that would give us all the data we wanted, like, this would not be an issue. But the fact of the matter is we have to send these expeditions out there to understand these things. And when you send an expedition out there, you can only send, like, one ship and five planes. Or, you know, five planes is, like, a huge... That's, like, most of the U.S. research fleet of aircraft. <laughs> And, you know, that's, I, I think that's the sense behind how complex these things are. I mean, like, it, it's not for lack of trying. Many campaigns have tried to do this, and they will continue to try to do this. But this is sort of the connection to the idea of at what point is it necessary to consider things for understanding so that we can solve problems versus novel understanding. And I think that both are incredibly important. I think that if we didn't believe that both are important, we wouldn't have things like nuclear power, or equivalently, we wouldn't have the fine arts, because both of those things are incredibly important to the human existence, to have new knowledge, both for the sake of making our lives easier, but also for the sake of humanity being this qualitative entity. I know that you were doing some modeling for trying to predict where ice formations would occur. I was just wondering if you could talk about this as it relates to giving people tools that make sense of information that they might not typically be aware of or, or how, it, how it affects the ice. Yeah. So for a while there, I was doing ice forecasts because I was really interested in what are the dynamics behind these really ephemeral routes that come into shape. Like I did my master's in Utah and one of the places that is climbed the most is Maple Canyon. And it's one of the places that I consider like one of the most special in my experience as a climber and in terms of absolute beauty in the middle of winter. So I was sort of curious, how do you come up with a better way of forecasting these things so you don't have to drive across the state to go look? Because that's kind of the state of the science right now is one of the friends from Salt Lake having to drive all the way to Joe's to see that the donor sickle isn't in fact in shape. For a while there, you know, like the way that you build a model is you first use intuition to look for patterns in the forecast, and then you try to build a model around that intuition so that you can actually quantify the behavior that you as a qualitative individual are trying to impose on the data. The thing that kind of crossed my mind was pursuing road icing models. Department of Transportation will model if roads are becoming iced for safety. Well, if you apply that to steep slopes, like isn't that basically what we're talking about? <laughs> we just want to know how that works and can you couple it to a weather model? It didn't really go all that far, but it was just sort of an interest of mine because I think that looking for solutions for interdisciplinary problems in areas that are not within your own is like really important. I think that it's really easy to get like sort of self-siloed into just reading your own literature. So it was more of like a, a mindset around that. But the one that you're talking about in terms of the uh, presentation that I gave for the folks at the scratch pad, those aren't really part of the same thing. They're just two interests as someone who was a climber and wanted to give back something to the community that's just sort of fun and also like 
gets people thinking about science in a way that's maybe not as traditional as, you know, say like measuring a ball bearing flying through the air or whatever. The secondary one was our friend Meg was killed in an accident last winter. That same sort of mindset of, well, I'm starting to see a pattern in the data set. How do I build a model around this thing? Is that, you know, there were a number of these column collapse accidents that occurred. So what looked like a fully attached on top and bottom column that someone decided to climb and then the entire thing just pulled out. And luckily another friend was fine, but the thing that happened to Meg happened. And I think it's important for us to evaluate these things because frankly, climbing accidents have this sort of behavior about them once someone in the community dies, sort of like they died doing what they loved and they, you know, did everything they could do and that sort of thing. And that tends to cloud the fact that we need to really look into ourselves and understand what happened here so it doesn't continue to happen. On one side of it, it's our own behavior of, you know, hanging it out there when it's quite obvious that we shouldn't. But there are also these nuanced sort of difficult to parse, like they did everything right and they were still under the chopping block. I'd say my own interest in this area is like, well, you know, are we looking closely enough at the data that's in front of us? I put together this model that basically is a pretty basic level, like differential equation solver that optimizes between the mass of and density of ice and the geometry of it and the geometry of the attachment point of the ice. So the question that I was wondering is basically like, if I change the inputs to this model, do the physics of the ice change? Of course they do, but do they change in a way that's appreciable enough to step it over the line of this is not strong enough to hold a climber, let alone itself? That's one of the things we found is that the way that ice works is it likes being in a dagger form and it likes being in a column form when the top and bottom are attached. However, when you have these very delicate freeze-thaw cycles in a warm winter climate like Utah, you end up undermining the ice because it's constantly flowing, like water is constantly flowing through the porosity of the internal structure of a column. When that water temperature, this is just theory, you know, speaking to this because we've dug into it, but, you know, not necessarily what observations to say. You essentially tend to have a slope of stone beneath it that's sloping away from the wall. So downward sloping. I mean, that's what you expect because you walk up to an ice climb. You don't walk down to it usually. And the thing that you get is what we're kind of calling a slip out collapse, where because the geometry of a cone is, I, I think it's something like less than half the volume of the equivalent cylinder that's attached to the attachment point, you change the mass that's hanging from that attachment point proportionally. Essentially, the thing that happens is a dagger forms and it's well attached because there isn't that much ice hanging from it because it necks down to a point and doesn't actually touch. But once it does touch and starts building diameter at the bottom, you're increasing the mass that's actually attached to the attachment point at height. Once this water starts moving underneath that undermines this climb, the going theory is that once you start climbing up it, your ice tools don't displace enough ice down low to break it where you're standing. But once you get to a certain height, there's so much ice underneath you that your tools essentially trip a hair trigger once you get close to the attachment point and the entire thing pulls out. Um, and it can be not only just the tool itself causing the ice to fail, but it can be so sensitive that the vibrations of swinging into the ice are enough to trigger it. And in the case of Meg's accident, that's sort of what we're thinking might be the case because the upper tool that was swung in was actually above the fracture line. So we think that it might have been a vibration that was enough to trigger this. It's not within my experience to understand this is like a field that's known as glaciology that tends to be tangent to geology and those sorts of areas. 
The sort of perfect person to understand how this works is someone who is both a mechanical engineer and has a sense of ice physics as well as a result of being a glaciologist or working with a glaciologist. I implore other people to look at these systems because human lives have been lost as a result of this sort of thing. And, you know, like from the meteorology side, these conditions tend to happen when you have really wide swings in temperature in the forecast. So like in the case of the accident at Raven Falls, we had a stint of above freezing temperatures and then it dropped down again late in the season and this climb formed up. These really rapid changes in temperature don't only affect whether or not the ice forms, but also the temperature of the creeks as well as the temperature of the precipitation that's going into the creeks. And that's really one of the important factors as well to keeping these uh, climbs put together is that you need to have optimal temperature range for not only what you're climbing, but also what's flowing through it. Because technically, that's also what you're climbing. <laughs> Understanding all these aspects. Um, I think it was partially a way of helping myself through the loss as well. Meg was one of the first friends that I met in Salt Lake when I moved there for my master's. And it's one of these things that's like, I don't think that we should live in this community that just buries this loss and doesn't look closely at what actually happened. Because death in the mountains is not glamorous. It's not this sort of behavior that's like, oh, well, they died a hero. They died this. It's like, no, this ice climb came falling down. And the closest metaphor I can come up with is, you know, it licked its fingers and snubbed out the candle. And the candle was out and that was the end of it. And if we sit on that and not evaluate ways that we can become better and find ways to inform the next generation of alpinists as to what the possible outcomes are in both an already dynamic environment in the mountains, plus the introduction of climate change factors, we'd be doing a disservice to that generation the same way that, say, we weren't left with the fact that, like, you can both be a good climber and you can be safe in the mountains from the generations prior, right? Like... There, there are learnings that we will give to our next generation, and I hope that this is one of those things, is we can do better, we can know more, and we can use that knowledge to keep people from making poor decisions in the mountains. When you were talking about the physics of water vapor and how it's more of an engineering problem, I wonder if similarly it's an engineering problem with understanding like local microclimates is where ice forms as well because there's just a lack of data. So you'd have to know temperature of the water flowing through the creek, through the center of the pillar as it's forming, or the temperature of the ambient rock, things like that, how much solar radiation it's getting. Like it's, it's quite complex. Right now, you might look at historic, like a week back for local climate and weather, and you might look for like consistency in freezing temperatures, for example, to like give you a better sense of like, okay, I feel like safe that this might be more solid. But you still might not know until you get there. Are there other factors that people should be considering? in determining their own model when thinking about going out for a climb? The way that I always phrase it is, if I'm on the fence, I'm not on the fence. Because if you're on the fence, you shouldn't be there. That's generally the way it should be. Honestly, one of the most incredible experiences as a scientist I think I've had is hearing uh, Will Gadd talk on his experience about this as well during the same um, speaker series. Because his exact experience was ex exactly in line with what the model said. The unfortunate thing is then what that says is you have to go out there to look. But at the same time, Will has played it extremely conservatively for a very long time. He's also an incredible athlete. That's not to say that other people can't have that same level of knowledge or that same level of aptitude for these things. But you were alluding to the fact that all of the information that we have about these things is implicit. I'm implying that the temperature of the creeks is warm because the air temperature is warm. I don't specifically know the temperature of the creeks. That's the crux of observations in the world. How much can I know? And then how much can I back out from what I know of other things? If I were to say what I think is probably the safest thing is that if you get temperatures above freezing for a week, that's the temperature of the rock probably. If that's the temperature of the rock, is it actually capable of staying attached? You can run through these thought experiments in your mind, and they're actually relatively realistic because 
rock above freezing, whether it's warm because the air temperature is warm or warm because the water flowing over it is, is warm, will do the same thing to it. It'll delaminate the ice. It's really extremely difficult to have a quantitative answer to this. It's one of the things that's really scary about the sport and more eloquent people than I have pontificated on how you don't die in the mountains. At the end of the day, like all we're left to say is there's uncertainty and playing it conservative is the way that you stay alive. The only thing that I can add to it is if you're questioning if something is possible or if something is dangerous, then you should play it on the conservative side. And if it's the sort of instance of, I thought it was fine, completely invested, full commit, and it wasn't fine, I think that it's important to reevaluate what happened there. And I hope that those things, those experiences don't coincide with people getting killed. And this is the like, you know, 10,000 hours on top rope sort of thing. It's like understanding how ice works learning from those who are more experienced and those who do play it conservatively. Because at the end of the day, it's like the outcome is not glamorous. And frankly, what do you get from being the person who can climb WI6 or whatever? You're the same person. Wouldn't you rather be climbing WI5 until you're 70 versus being the person who climbed WI6 and then got the chop because you didn't read conditions? Like what a stupid way to die. It's like falling down in the lift line, but then someone shoots you. Like it's fucking stupid. I think if most of us were honest, we'd probably, I'm sort of paraphrasing another guess, but we'd, we'd probably be just go out and do 20 pitches of 5.7 in a big, beautiful setting, and that'd be great climbing. You don't really need to do more. You, you would do that without having to post it to Instagram and things like that, just because it's the joy in, in the experience and the joy in the movements of it without the fear factor. I think we sort of inflate the value of things that are hard versus things that are beautiful. They're not mutually inclusive nor exclusive. I mean, like, you can have both, you can have either. You know, in my experience, I tend to walk a long ways for a pitch of 5'7", I feel like. <laughs> and that's like my entire climbing career is like, wow, I just like carried a 50 pound pack for like six miles to go climb two pitches of 5'7". I guess, I guess that makes me a climber. <laughs> I mean, the ego component is relevant because there has been a proliferation of like these ice fall videos recently. Yeah, I don't I don't see why we're trying to glorify that. I had a friend come up to me who had just started ice climbing maybe like the season before and he was talking about how he was pulling on to WI5 on lead and that he'd already taken I think something like three screw falls. It was pretty shocking honestly and it's like I don't know how to steer that. I think there is this culture of glorifying dangerous things. You know, I know we talked about free solo, but that's like an example of that sort of thing. And it's like his space to do that. And I'm not trying to like tell him that he did something wrong. I don't think that free soloing El Cap is a bad thing to do. I think that it's just, it is a bad thing to communicate to others that this is a normal thing to do. And I realized that movie didn't necessarily do that, but like, you should do dangerous things because they're philosophically there for you and because the risk is negligibly low that the outcome will happen. It's easy to look at these people and not understand how many hours of work went into getting to that place to even consider it, let alone doing it. Rock climbing is one of these things that's like the barrier to entry is really high. Like it's it's hard to climb hard rock. Like that is objectively true. I don't think that's necessarily true as much with ice climbing. To get to WI5, most people can top rope WI5 on their first day of climbing if they can climb like 5.7 or 5.8. On top rope, not leading, of course. But I come across these sorts of, you know, examples in like clinics that I teach at festivals and going out climbing next to folks who are learning and they're like, I don't see why people say this is so difficult. It's so easy. And it's like, yeah, you're holding jugs. Yeah, you're, you know, you can make a foot where you really want to and that sort of thing. But like, it's easy to then assume that that's the way it is through its entire experience, as opposed to understanding that shielding yourself from the, the risk profile by being on top rope, and therefore you do not understand the entire system. 
five twelve on sport now is like you know it's hard. Like don't get me wrong. Like I still stretch on five twelve because like who doesn't? But like it's like laughable if you consider yourself like a real climber if you're only climbing like five twelve in the like general discourse. But like if you're climbing five twelve on gear, it's like oh who's this stud? You know. <laughs> I think that that's the sort of thing we're talking about here in terms of like ice. It's just like, if you're climbing WI five on top rope, yeah, sure. Okay. But the ease of doing that does not communicate the difficulty of doing it when you're putting up the rope yourself, not only the like physical aspects, but like the emotional aspects that influence the physical aspects and those sorts of things. I think that the more we make climbing approachable, the more we have to consider the fact that there are certain aspects that you can't inherently make more approachable because you don't want them to be approachable because they are really dangerous. Leading ice is one of these things. The thing that I tell people when I'm teaching is like, for the love of God, spend as much time not leading ice as you can. What is there to be gained from doing that when you get a free top rope if you're going out with somebody who's already doing it? You get so much out of just going top roping and learning how ice works and then mock leading things and taking your time to do this. I mean, like I started ice climbing when I was like 13 or 14 on Mount Washington. I thought I was like, you know, a stud for climbing WI2. It took me until maybe like 2018 to pull on to WI5 on lead. I still, I, I don't think I've climbed a proper six. Of you know, religious experience six. <laughs> and I don't think that there's a problem with that. We really glorify the idea of things being dangerous and difficult, but like, you don't have to do that to have a good time in the mountains. The ratcheting up of speed and increase in difficulty, it's not the only measurement of success or developing, right? And especially as it relates to ice climbing. And there seems to be a lot of invisibility as it relates to ice climbing in particular, like a lack of understanding really what the climbing is about. It's not the difficulty that's primary and, and most important. It's, it's being able to read the ice and understanding the ice. And that seems to be lost in translation quite a bit. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think that there's also a loss of the history behind why these things exist. It's a necessity thing. Right? Like it's a necessity thing that became its own pleasure. We needed to get to the top of this pitch and it was too steep for us to cut steps in. So now we figure we have to figure out a different way of doing it. And then it became its own sport because people enjoyed that part of it. The amount of time it took some of the best alpinists in the world to figure out how this works is longer than most of the people who've been like learning how to climb WI5 have been alive. Between, like, say, when Yvonne Chouinard was, like, cutting steps and climbing, like, the Californiana on Cerro Chalten to, like, you know, these amazing phenoms who are doing, like, these amazing, like, mixed climbing feats of strength at UIAA comps as well as climbing hard routes that are, like, still under the age of 20. I mean, like, it took that long to get an ice tool to work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> let alone to learn how to use it right. I think patience is really important. Again, like not for lack of trying. You can both work extremely hard and be patient. And I think that doing those two things will make you a better both person and climber in the long run. Depends on your goals. Yeah, my, my main goal is getting sponsored by Red Bull, obviously, so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, oh, the the Fluke, the Fluke Totten, what, what is the name of their... Uh ridiculous flying oh is that the like pushing something off a dock and trying yeah. to get it to fly thing i feel yeah. like that would be a good summer uh vacation for you depending which direction to go and uh, i guess i'm wondering how how you're doing the answer i usually give is i'm just chugging along and that's kind of the thing i have this constant battle with myself and my girlfriend kate about if i'm climbing enough working this job down in la has made me feel like I haven't been climbing enough yet at the same time, like I've been climbing plenty of rock, been climbing, you know, ice a few times this winter and it's really not that sort of thing. It's been an experiment in patience for me. If I had my way, I'd be uh, climbing and skiing every single day, but reality prevents that, unfortunately. Yeah, I thought it was a good festival season. I love when 
you know, I'm teaching an ice clinic and you see the spark go of like how an ice tool is supposed to work, how you're supposed to feel when you're climbing ice, those sorts of things. And like people try to come up with these like sort of formulaic ways that you're supposed to climb ice. Like I'm not going to say the A-frame is wrong, but I think that you should feel what it's supposed to feel like and then tune it towards what the most efficient thing is. It's different for everyone. If I told you that the way that you dyno is you just reach for it, you're going to tell me to go fuck myself. And rightfully so. I think like you should feel what a route's supposed to feel like before you know how it's supposed to work. And that's, yeah, it's a nice thing to have in your life. I've been having that opportunity lately of being able to evaluate the things that are important to me, things that I want to see progress into the future and things that I'm casting aside and, you know, all these sorts of things and constantly trying to figure out like the path forwards that allows me to feel both fulfilled, you know, mentally as well as physically, as well as caring about those around me who are important to me. So yeah, um, I'm fine. (laughs) Just chugging along. Is that a process that you go through systematically, say every six months or a year where you're evaluating sort of the essentials of your life and sort of, you know, like if you were in grad school, for example, you might say like, this is the priority for the next three, five plus years. And, you know, I'm I'm willing to to depreciate the amount of time I'm climbing elsewhere. You have a new job. There are certain pros of it. When you took that, was there that evaluation of like, I know what I'm getting into for the next, I don't know if it's a startup or or whatnot, but like the next few years or. Yeah, it's a startup sort of thing. I don't tend to think of it as I'm like backing out of things. I tend to think of it as what are the foundations that I'm lacking in that when I come back to the things that are deeply important to me that I don't feel like I'm lacking in. Namely, like doing as many leg lifts and pull ups as I can, (laughs) you know, but on the other side, it's like, we're so lucky as humans living on earth because we have these beautiful things called seasons. I find that my life just sort of seems to automatically orient itself around the seasons. I don't have to look for changes of pace. They just kind of come about on their own, which I think is is very fortunate. For a long time, that was very tightly coupled to say like the academic year while I was doing my PhD and that sort of thing. More so just the literal seasons now. You know, it's no different than when you start to see the leaves fall, you start to realize I should probably chop some wood for the winter, that sort of thing. On your website, you talked about how supporting diversity in higher education and climbing as well was important to you. Do you mind just maybe talking about how you're doing that? Since I wrote that on my website, I think the thing that's kind of come around to me is realizing that the things that support diversity in education are actually just supporting socioeconomic equality in our country. I've been doing a lot of reading of like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of like Rudger Bregman or um, Rebecca Solnit, those sorts of authors that are very concerned with like societal introspection sort of thing. The way that you help people who are struggling is to give them resources. I always find it very ironic because I'm, you know, I'm Chinese. My grandfather came across as an illegal immigrant. This might be just a family tall tale, but I've heard from my grandma as well as others that he was the first Chinese American citizen to be naturalized through enlisting in the military. So he enlisted in World War II and was... um, he was a radio operator on a B-24 over Italy and was actually downed and had to like survive in, in the wilderness for days and days. I find it ironic sometimes to hear people espousing that the minority that they reside within is purely the thing that ties them to adversity. My family knows no end to adversity being first, second, third generation Chinese family in America. But at the same time, I've been given so, so much. I can't even begin to tell you how grateful I am for the fact that I've had the chance to get the education I have and do the things that I've done, which are all things that are correlated with socioeconomic status and very uncorrelated to the color of my skin. It's important for us to fight for everyone who lives here. And it's important to fight for equity for those who are oppressed and fight for their rights as individuals and their ability to exist safely in their society, whether they are a marginalized group because they face oppression and persecution because of 
gender or sexual orientation or skin color or whatever, like they need support because they face adversity that is undue to them as a result of the unrealistic prejudices that exist in our society. But do I think that it has only to do with the fact that I'm Chinese, therefore I suffer, therefore, you know, support me? I think that I would be pretty naive to to feel that way. I think that we should help people who need help. You said you wanted to leave listeners with more questions than answers, although I feel like we did, gave quite a lot of answers <laughs> today. Are there any questions that you might suggest that listeners consider or contemplate after listening to this episode or maybe in the upcoming week? Yeah. What are things in your own life that have infinite complexity upon closer inspection? whether quantitative or qualitative. Clouds are fractals. You're good. Thank you very much, Jackson, for, for joining today. I really appreciate what you're doing with putting together this community pillar of people who care about ice climbing and that sort of thing, because what the climbing community provides to its participants is really just that, like a community of friends that we look to each other for support and new knowledge and help to move forwards in our own progression. You know, we live in this sport that's very like, people get killed regularly and people have a lot of um, issues with grief and how we express that grief through our sport. And then, you know, the other feedbacks that happen as a result of that. So, you know, I, I, I'd rather be the person to support other people. So people are going through it. Like, I hope that I can be that person for others. If you're interested in collaborating on one of the ice climbing models that Jackson mentioned, you can reach him at jackson.yip at utah.edu. To connect with him on Instagram, he's at jp underscore yip. And as for the podcast, we're coming to an end for season one. If you've enjoyed episodes like this, consider becoming a Patreon member. We're mainly listener supported and your backing keeps the lights on here. Thanks for listening.